Okay, okay, so uh, welcome everybody. I am Stefano Valerio, I'm a research assistant at uh, Fondazione per l'Ambiente Touring School of Regulation, which is the organization uh, which arranged this webinar and roundtable we are holding this afternoon from Italy. Of course, here, here in Italy it's afternoon. I don't know what part of the day is in other countries of the world since, uh, as we were saying before starting the recording session, there were almost 150 applicants from all over the world. Uh, and so we would like, of course, to thank you because you decided to participate and eventually to show up, even though we started promoting this event just uh, a few days ago. I will leave the floor to Monica, Monica Postiglione, who is the executive coordinator of our research organization. She, of course, will illustrate more in depth than me the rationale of this initiative. So I will spend just a few minutes in order to um, describe the structure and the outline of, the, of this webinar. And afterwards, I will uh, spend just a few more words to uh, introduce and present the speakers. Uh, and of course, we also thank, uh, thank them uh, because of the acceptance of our invitation. So uh, very briefly, very shortly, uh, there will be uh, four questions uh, which we organized uh, before the event, which we um, conceived. Two of these questions would be in a way general, so each uh, speaker will have the possibility to reply to these two questions. Other two questions uh, will be in a way more targeted and specific. Uh, in the sense that will be asked directly and personally to one of the speakers according to his own main field of expertise. After these four questions, if um, as we always do, we will have enough time to have a sort of exchange and debate also with the participants, we will pick and collect some of the questions uh, you will decide to text and ask in the chat window. So you can use the chat window of this Zoom session in order to write your question during the discussion. Of course, you can choose the option of uh, uh, writing the question and making uh, it public so that everyone can read it, uh, both panelists and uh, participants, or the other attendees. Otherwise, of course, you can use the chat window to write your question, just uh, making them public to the panelists. Um, as I was saying, I will leave the floor directly to Monica. Uh, just a few words more. Uh, to present the speakers. Uh, we have uh, today, and we are a pleasure, we are delighted to have today with us Basis Oikonomu, who is an economist. He works uh, in particular at the IECP, which is the Institute for European Energy and Climate Policy, which is based mainly in the Netherlands. Uh, he is particularly, particularly involved in research about uh, the relationship between the economy and environment, and in particular, economy and energy, economics and energy markets. We also have Marco Ravina, he is from Italy, uh, more precisely from the Polytechnic of Turin, which is one of the two main universities in the city of Turin, which actually is, is also the city of our research organization. And he is an engine, an engineer. Um, and finally, there's also Dario Caro, an Italian researcher working in Denmark at the University of Aarhus, if I'm not wrong. And he is also um, he also works for a specific interdisciplinary department, which is called Center for Climate Change at the same university. So I think uh, I can uh, leave the floor to Monica, who will be more precise than me, illustrating uh, the aim, the goals, and why we decided to take on this initiative. Thanks for your attention, and see you afterwards. Thank you, Stefano, and thanks to the speaker for accepting our invitation to participate to this webinar on COVID-19, Economy, Environment and Health. Um, Fondazione per l'Ambiente has, uh, since the beginning uh, of its uh, activities, been focusing the attention uh, to the environment from many different perspectives. And uh, during the years, we have been active uh, in evaluating uh, environmental policies and strategies aiming to drive towards a more sustainable and clean organization of public services, clean energy production and provision, water and waste management, and the reduction of all pollutants, and uh, recently with a particular attention to their quality. 
Climate change uh, and its mitigation is at the center of the many um, different projects that we have been involved in recent years at the local, national and international level. And um, in the last months uh, during our online activities, we have been discussing about some aspects of uh, COVID-19 effects on uh, uh, other temps on which we, uh, our activities in recent years have been focusing, in particular on the platform economy and on data and digitalization. But now we are very glad to have the possibility to go back to the environmental themes uh, and to discuss uh, about uh, what uh, this uh, COVID-19 has meant for the environment. Um, the effects uh, of the virus uh, uh, are closely linked to the envir to environmental issues from many perspectives. On the one hand, some studies try to investigate a possible correlation between the same evolution of the virus uh, to not sustainable anthropic activities and uh, its expansion and incidence uh, to the concentration of pollutants and in particular of fine, fine dust pollution. On the other hand, uh, so this is the first uh, link to the, <laughs> between the COVID-19 and the virus, but on the other hand, what resulted to be particularly interesting is the impact that the virus indirectly determined, determined on the environment. Uh, because the, the reduction and reorganization of the economic and anthropic activities has been considered for a long time uh, uh, a fundamental remedy to mitigate pollution and to redu reduce the main causes of ongoing climate change. And in the last months, somehow this virus succeeded in what environmental policies struggled for many years and forced uh, a huge part of the world to reduce drastically economic activities and travel to the limits. So um, we have been able to observe how this lockdown uh, that many countries have undergone uh, has determined a strong alteration of the effects of pollutants and of their impact on the environment, sometimes producing temporary improvement in a series of parameters. Clearly, it is impossible to say that this has been a positive, uh, positive thing for our society. We are and we will probably continue to experience the disruption caused, caused by the virus for decades. But on the other side, this emergency gave us the possibility to analyze what the reduction of these activities would mean, especially in terms of air pollution and carbon emission. The data collected in many contexts have been demonstrating these trends, and even if uh, data are still under observation and we don't want to risk to say something that is not uh, already um, sure. Uh, what is always more clear is the strong correlation that exists between economy, health and environment. Um, Clearly, the measure um, and the, the, the reduction of the economical and anthropic activities uh, are temporary and are still uh, changing, and uh, things are going back to normality in many countries. But and we, it would be hard to convert the, product, the, the productive structure in a more sustainable one, and probably the effort to return to previous rates of growth in economical terms. Uh, are even likely to worsen the situation, but hopefully something will change. Uh, environmental protection policies have been implemented in recent years in many countries, and the effort to go in the direction of a sustainable energy transition has been characterizing, for example, the European context, and hopefully an increasing attention to the environment will be central uh, to the post-COVID economic policies also in other contexts. So this seminar aims to discuss and analyze some of these aspects with the three experts that uh, Stefano just introduced. And um, I will start uh, with the first question, which is for uh, all of you. And uh, it, uh, so the first question um, is if you can describe us uh, uh, in more details, because my introduction has been general, um, what uh, uh, COVID-19 has been able to show in general terms with respect to air quality and also in relation to patterns of energy consumption and production. 
So um, what has happened and which uh, have been the trends, uh, if you can say something also of like worldwide with the situation in other parts of the world and uh, of course since uh, you are all from Europe uh, uh, with a focus on the European situation. So I don't know who want to start, uh, maybe uh, Dario, uh, Dario Caro? Yes, yes, I can start. So, um, first of all, thanks to, for the invitation here. Uh, I'm just trying to link to uh, your, uh, what you said before. So, the first thing is that, uh, of course, with the lockdown, so many things happen also to our environment and uh, to our economy. And there is a, there is a huge connection uh, between uh, these two aspects. First of all, it's good to, to uh, divide between uh, what you said, but I would like to repeat. So we have a, a retroactive uh, effect and a proactive effect. So the retroactive effect is the effect that pollution may have played on the uh, virus. Uh, and so the, the, the connection between virus and pollution. So this is the retroactive. The proactive is the effect that lockdown may have played on the pollution. So, and of course, it's a, it's a positive effect uh, um, in environmental terms. So uh, concerning the, 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 the pollution, we need to distinguish uh, between two categories, in my opinion, uh, in, in this specific situation. So, uh, from one hand, we have the traditional pollutants, and uh, from another hand, we have uh, the greenhouse gas emissions. So, this is very different, so uh, for several reasons. First of all, traditional pollutants are the pollution that it's like negative to be brief, to be touch, uh, to be in contact with the human. Uh, the, the greenhouse gas emissions are negative for the planet and of course indirectly they are negative also for human race because we live in this planet. So, um, but concerning the lockdown we have a huge difference in the impact of these two categories. Uh, pollutants, for example, is possible to see a, a decrease during the, the lockdown also from satellite imaging uh, because uh, you have an, uh, an immediate reduction of pollution when you switch off your economic system. In the case of the greenhouse gas emissions, uh, uh, you have to use analytical, an analytical approach to observe this reduction. That's just mainly due to the lifetime of the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So the greenhouse gases in atmosphere last uh, almost, we can say, for example, the carbon dioxide last in the, in the atmosphere for about uh, 100 years. So now in the atmosphere, you have also the, the CO2 emission released in atmosphere 100 uh, years ago. 99 years ago, 98 years ago, and so on until today. So in this case, the lockdown is two months of switch of the economy. Uh, you cannot realize a, a, a decrease uh, from satellite, for example. Concerning the, the pollutants, instead, you can immediately realize a, a decrease because they have a lifetime very short in the atmosphere. So if you switch off your system, you realize immediately a decrease. And it's what we saw from the uh, imaging that everybody, I think, uh, have seen uh, in, the, in the newspapers with the decrease of the pollution, especially in north of Italy or in other uh, high pollution area in, in the world. Uh, so this is the first difference. Concerning the uh, correlation uh, in one of my recent study, we, we found a correlation between pollution and the high lethality uh, of, the, of the virus. Uh, that's a, a sort of a physiopathogenic correlation, uh, which means that we found that the action of the virus is the same, goes in the same direction of the action of pollution. 
So uh, being uh, uh, the coronavirus, um, uh, we can say lung related problem, uh, and uh, especially when you die from coronavirus, uh, is about uh, 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 a huge increase of uh, inflammation of the cytokine. Uh, we found that people living in polluted area, they have already uh, a higher level of uh, cytokine also in healthy people. Uh, when I say healthy, I mean that people that they, they don't have specific disease or they don't have a specific recovery in the hospital, uh, but just for the uh, fact that they live in polluted area, they have already a high level of cytokine. Then we realized that the effect of the virus uh, concern the level of cytokine. Uh, so it's a mechanism of action, uh, then I'm not a doctor, so I cannot go more in deep about that. But of course, the study was done in collaboration with doctors. Uh, from this point of view, we can find a correlation. So we can say that uh, if you live in a more, uh, in a high pollution area, high polluted area, uh, then you are more prone to be uh, you are more prone to die from coronavirus. That's an easy correlation in terms of uh, uh, pathogenic uh, uh, aspect and mechanism. Um, yes, I think, uh, yes. Um. Uh, this is uh, very interesting uh, because it's another correlation aspect that uh, I didn't mention in the introduction, but it, which is really important uh, and uh, so it gives us uh, more information also about, for example, the situation in this part uh, uh, of uh, northern Italy where the pollution is a problem. And also in, uh, in, in other parts of the world, like big cities. So there is a correlation also to the kind of uh, urban environment uh, in which uh, people are living. So I will switch the, the, give the floor to Marco Ravina for, uh, to answer to this uh, first question. Yes, Marco. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you for uh, the invitation and good afternoon to you all. Um, uh, what, what has happened during this uh, period? I think that uh, mm, uh, it's undoubted that uh, it, this uh, dramatic event uh, has been and uh, is a, a unique opportunity to study the interaction between uh, uh, pollutant emission and, uh, and air quality worldwide. Um, I will start from uh, uh, an obvious uh, consideration. So the, the, that is, if, uh, I, if I turn off a pollution source, uh, I expect that I, the air quality I breathe uh, will improve, depending on, on the strengths of that uh, source. Uh, this is uh, uh, basically what this uh, event uh, showed us. Uh, but I would say not only. Um, this period also showed us, or, or maybe gave us some confirmation uh, about the. Um, I'm, think, I'm referring particularly to uh, uh, to local pollution. Um, uh, this period showed us that uh, the relationship between emission and uh, air quality is not, uh, I would say, uh, straightforward. But the dynamics of the atmosphere are. are are more complex uh, and different factors may contribute to the to the final results. Um, I, I will uh, I'm referring particularly to the uh, data of northern Italy because we, we work uh, with uh, with this data but this uh, consideration can be extended to to other regions. Um, we know that uh, that uh, northern Italy is a particular uh, area that has a particular orographic configuration, and often often it suffers of uh, poor uh, air quality episodes, especially in winter. And in this area, during the COVID-19 uh, lockdown, uh, a huge amount of sources was uh, was temporarily shut down. Um, so the same happened in other uh, countries and regions, as I said. So if we, um, I, I went to look at the data reported by the environmental uh, protection agencies, um, we observed, uh, we observed um, a decrease of emissions, in particular uh, 
traffic, emission from traffic, from mobility. Uh, in northern Italy, this emission was about uh, uh, in the order of 60 uh, to 80 percent. Um, conversely, we, we observed a little bit, a uh, slight increase of uh, uh, emission from residential um, heating, uh, about uh, five, five percent, let's say. Um, so there was a, uh, it is confirmed that there was a reduction in emission. The, the consideration changed if we consider the concentration. So what, what happened to concentration? And here we have a different uh, consideration if we consider uh, primary pollutants, in particular uh, NO2, or uh, particular matter in, in, uh, in principle. Uh, <clears throat> in, in most cases, in the reported data, um, the concentration trends showed um, um, that a consistent reduction with respect to the average of previous years could not be seen if we consider PM 2.5. Um, this is uh, valid for uh, all main European uh, cities. Uh, this emission, um, the emission reduction of NO2 instead was uh, translated into a significant lowering of NO2 concentrations. Uh, so NO2 concentration were, were significantly lower than the average of uh, previous uh, years. Uh, the, the same results uh, were, were also confirmed by uh, observation by NASA or uh, also another, uh, uh, for example, another important study in, uh, in northern China. Um, so these uh, preliminary results uh, gave us uh, some important points of discussion that I would say are more confirmation that uh, uh, that, uh, that that uh, new new findings. Uh, so the fir first I would say uh, confirmation is that uh, uh, NO2, uh, the presence of NO2, uh, as well as uh, uh, other minor pollutants like. Uh, um, I would say benzoparine or other aromatics uh, such as uh, benzene or toluene um, is strictly related, not only, but strictly related to traffic uh, emissions. Um, someone could say that, uh, we already knew that, uh, um, but I think that this uh, event, this period, uh, is a unique, uh, I would say, laboratory uh, that gives us the opportunity to uh, analyze to what extent uh, traffic emission contribute to NO2 concentration, in particular uh, at the local level. And so this same consideration could be uh, extended to the, to the other minor pollutants I, uh, I mentioned. Um, and a, a second con consideration that I would say is also a confirmation is that the that uh, this uh, observation uh, showed us that the fate and the dynamics of pollutants in the lower atmosphere, in particular for secondary pollutants like uh, PM, uh, depends heavily on, uh, on many factors. And meteorology and local weather condition is one major, uh, major factor. Um, just to give an example, uh, looking at the data from uh, of, uh, PM10 concentration in Piedmont, I found uh, the, the, um, a, day, uh, a couple of days um, at the end of March where the PM10 concentration was uh, recorded at the uh, ground station, uh, was higher than the average of uh, last year. It was, I think, uh, 27, 28 of, of uh, March. And then um, looking at the, the data, uh, it was uh, supposed that this, uh, this PN10 wa was due to um, an intercontinental transport of coming from deserts, so uh, dust, uh, they call intrusion. And so this is uh, just an example to show that some uh, natural factors in, in, in for, for this particular pollutant have overcome all the emission reduction uh, independently from the, the situation. Um, 
However, uh, I would say that this is only the, the beginning because we have a lot of data to uh, to an data to analyze, and uh, I think that many important findings will uh, will come in uh, next uh, next month. Thank you, Marco. Uh, maybe you will tell us something more in detail in the next question. But now I would like to leave the floor to Vlasis uh, um, to talk about uh, another important aspect. He's an expert in the energy sector, which is uh, the other big uh, um, uh, actor in this situation because uh, energy consumption has been transformed by the the, the, the COVID-19 and the lockdown. Mm -hmm. So if you can tell us what happened in the energy sector. Yeah. Thank you very much also for the invitation and thank you for inviting us to inviting me to a panel which is quite diverse from all the other ones we are participating thus far because this every, almost all panels are quite technical into one topic. But now this one is more diverse, at least with diverse scientists and it's more interesting to see the same problem from different angles. Now, um, as you rightly said, okay, we are working mainly on the energy efficiency and energy aspects. So I'll just go briefly through a um, travel of what has happened in, uh, in the energy part globally in the EU during the COVID period. I would say that uh, indeed the, the same assumptions that my colleagues in the two presentations before, um, that we don't really know yet too much on that. Still the research is ongoing. We still try yet to understand what the implications are, what is happening. So far, we just have the data of the three, four months that we can make some estimations. And given also that um, the issue of energy is so much directly linked to the issue of economy, so meaning on the GDP growth, um, the, the uncertainties are much higher in this field. Why I'm saying that is that next to the COVID, which was a three, two, three months uh, lockdown, uh, we have a recession going on, a global economic recession. Uh, the, um, the degree of this recession will also formulate the degree of the energy landscape. And therefore, since we do not have yet this data and we don't, we don't really have these scenarios quite clear, as we don't really yet know, there are some assumptions going on, uh, the situation will be even more uncertain. Now, let's see more or less what happened, though, during these uh, strange months in the, from uh, February or March, let's say, now. Uh, on the energy part, uh, we had this, uh, the, the phenomenon that the residential uh, electricity demand, so meaning how much we use in our households, increased a lot in uh, most of the economies. Why is that? Because as I think all of us, as I see now, we're spending our, most of our time at home. We're undertaking more activities at home, um, family, kids, teleworking, uh, more television, more appliances, which makes a lot of sense, more heating also. So um, just to give you an idea is that in the last week of uh, March, for example, in the first week of April, I'm using some uh, data that I read recently in the International Energy Agency report that came out. Uh, the residential demand uh, during the week was about 40% higher across certain European economies than what was uh, the same weeks in 2019. So you can imagine that for some large economies in the EU, what would this signify in terms of uh, kilowatt hours and, um, and also linking it up to emissions and all the discussion my two colleagues had before that. Then, though, uh, we must say that the, all these increases in the residential demand uh, were uh, actually completely outweighed by the reduction of uh, the energy use in the commercial and industrial operations. Um, as we had a, a large drop in the demand for all the commercial activities and the industrial activities and transport and so forth, uh, we had a large decline on the demand. And on average, we would say that from calculations made by the AI, by the IA, is that for every month of uh, full lockdown activities, like it happened in most of the EU countries, this, uh, this could reduce the demand by 20% in average. And if you take it extended over the entire year, so if we assume that this uh, strange phenomenon will go on, it could end up to 1.5% on an annual basis a uh, reduction of demand, which you can imagine that the repercussions for um, the entire energy sector and all the employment linked to that, also all the system balances, payments, uh, costs for industries, it makes quite a big um, issue on how actually this, the economy is moving on uh, with these um, uh, energy changes. Now, if you take it on the global uh, part, let's say the global, at least for the electricity, uh, demand reduced by about 2.5% in the first quarter. Uh, and this has not taken yet into account the entire lockdown period. Now the new data will come out for the next quarter. So we'll see exactly, and I'm pretty sure these numbers will be much higher. 
Uh, of course, as you can understand, the high, the measure, the, the sectors that were hit most, at least from the countries that I see being represented here, indeed were um, the retail offices, uh, the commercial sectors, uh, tourism, education. Uh, most major economies were completely uh, out of these activities, and therefore the demand uh, reduced a lot. Uh, the, on the industrial level, though, the, for the economies that were more linked to industry, um, the lockdown measures we did not have such an extent on uh, such a hard extent effect on uh, on the electricity demand. But just to give you an idea, I mean, what numbers we're talking about. So I think it's easier for the um, for for the audience here. If we assume that the, since you're from Italy here, uh, the graph I saw from the IEA was mentioning like that for Italy for the first 30 days of the lockdown, the consumption, the electricity consumption fell by 27 point percent, 27 percent which is an enormous amount for the size of Italy and for the size of the households in Italy. Uh, likewise, for, um, for Spain, it was around uh, 20% only for the first 20 days we're referring to. And uh, for Germany, it was about 10% and for other countries, um, likewise. So indeed, if we take as, an, uh, you know, as a final point here is that indeed for the energy reduction, we had a large energy reduction, reduction in energy use and the electricity sector. And mainly this was, uh, we had, the, from the commercial and the, from the commercial and tertiary sector and transport, while on, in contrast, we had a slight increase on uh, on the residential sector, but this was still much smaller than the decrease from the other sectors. So in overall, we have a decrease. Now, uh, this is the scenario concerning the demand. If we go to the supply of electricity, uh, here we have a complete different picture and generally the supply of energy, because um, um, renewable energy was a big winner in the whole story. Um, so renewables have claimed uh, a great share in, uh, in the electricity generation um, as a result of the lockdown measures and, uh, and the reduction of the electricity demand. So um, let's say that uh, on average there was about 3% increase of the renewable-based generation. By renewable-based we mean everything on solar, um, wind, etc. <coughs> and um, this has to do with a, with a high percentage increase of the wind power and also a high increase on the solar PV power output as there were a lot of new projects from the last years that started operating during this period. Uh, about, you could consider like 28% more or less in the first quarter of the 2020 were from, um, were from the renewable energy supply, which is a big number. I've considered that in the past years we're speaking about 25, 26 and uh, somehow stuck. Now, the big loser, of course, is the coal in the whole story. Uh, coal reduced a lot. Um, and the coal power plants reduced a lot their activities. Uh, so there are several graphs which are nice to see from the IEA that uh, if you add up the solar, wind, and, uh, and all these low carbon sources, we have a, a much higher than a winner, let's say, much higher percentage from renewable energy part. Now, for uh, if we, uh, let's see what would happen, I mean, given the scenarios we have now, if we assume that we have, um, uh, let's say, a U-shaped uh, recovery, which is the one that many economists um, wrongly or rightly uh, claim that we, this will happen. Um, this can uh, actually still uh, push these uh, low carbon sources of electricity ahead, meaning that they can win still more uh, from the coal generation plants, which is better, of course, if we could take this uh, static um, pollutants from the coal plants. You can understand, based on what my previous colleague said, that this the situation could be better in the future, at least from this perspective. Now, uh, the, um, the, the projections for, uh, that if, from all this low carbon uh, share of generation, uh, power production could be about 40%, which is quite high. This is the highest level ever that we have seen in, uh, from this industry. And um, actually, the, um, the, the coal fire generation could even reduce uh, to the entire year falling about 10% in 2020. We have also seen that in several countries, like including my country in Greece, where I read recently that uh, there was for there were periods where there was almost no coal, no coal production. So it's ended up to zero, which is a nice part, of course, and it's a, it's a nice story for all the countries that want to move on ahead. Now, uh, also the gas fire generation, and that's where I think most of the interest will fall later on also in my in the discussion we'll be holding, I guess, is that when we speak about gas fire, which is not a clear, uh, which is not a clean, in a way, uh, fuel, uh, this will also be hit hard, and uh, it could, uh, it, based on the IA, it could sink back to 7% for the year. Now, uh, if we have a slower recovery, not so fast recovery, um, there will be further pressure on the coal, gas, and also on the nuclear, and there will be more, um, uh, more shift to the renewable energy sources in the overall uh, mix. 
This is more or less the story, if I can just give you a full picture. You know, as I mentioned, this is from the study carried out by the AIA, which has some, I think, the most realistic data now, up to now for the COVID uh, period. And uh, yeah, so in the conclusion, reduction of demand overall, increase of the renewable energy supply. So one bad and one good scenario so far. And then we'll move on to more technical aspects, I guess. Thank you. Thank you, Vlad. It's, uh, it was a clear uh, speech about uh, which uh, has been the main uh, transformation of the sector in this period. Clearly, um, it is interesting to have different speakers with different angles because uh, uh, in our opinion and the, the way the, the Fondazione per l'Ambiente has been working is to have, you know, like a multidisciplinary approach to analyze complex uh, uh, stuff. So COVID-19 uh, has been uh, also a laboratory from this perspective to show us uh, how the complexity of the situation has to be analyzed from different perspectives in order to even think about the possible strategies to move uh, on. And uh, so it's uh, very interesting to have uh, all of you talking with us about uh, uh, air pollution and the energy. And um, uh, so I want to switch again and go to the air quality, go back to the air quality topic. And to, so the, the second question, which, which is uh, directed to Dario Caro and Marco Ravina, is uh, again related to this uh, incredible laboratory, as Marco Ravina said before, that COVID uh, created for, <laughs> in particular, for um, to confirm uh, some uh, of the theory that has been discussed uh, in recent decades about the main um, uh, pollutants and uh, the, their role in creating uh, in some part of the world the, which are really polluted like the one that uh, in the northern Italy or in uh, in China and some in, in other um, urban areas related to which kind of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, pollutants are um, mainly uh, uh, polluting somehow. So uh, I wanted to ask uh, you if you can uh, describe us in more detail um, how, well, to Dario Caro, uh, because uh, we know that, as you mentioned before, uh, the, 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 the pollutants, some pollutants have been uh, carriers of the virus. Uh, and so if you can uh, uh, describe us uh, a bit better your research on this topic. And then uh, to Marco uh, Ravina, uh, if you go back to more details uh, on, the, on some evidence uh, uh, of the, 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 the COVID in relation to the air quality situation in general. Yes, so um, actually um, uh, the point here, the, the connection we are, uh, we found in, uh, in, uh, in our study and that is confirmed also from other studies, a connection with the lethality uh, of the virus. So the connection between pollution and lethality of the virus, fatality of the virus. So the connection, uh, um, meant uh, as uh, uh, pollution as a carrier of the virus uh, has been uh, uh, need to be confirmed from scientific literature so far. So for the moment, uh, the, the correlation we found uh, is about uh, um, living in polluted area and uh, uh, we have an high probability to die from coronavirus. And this is also confirmed from numbers even if numbers can change between uh, among countries uh, because we we know very well that it's there is a huge difference uh, in in uh, estimating the the when you estimate the, the lethality the lethality is the ratio between the number of cases and the number of deaths um, there is a high, um, we can say, uh, it's possible to change both the numerator and the denominator of this ratio, 
uh, depending on the country because for example you can uh, establish the uh, person is died uh, with coronavirus or um, from coronavirus which is different uh, so in this case what we found is what we said is just look at one country and compare different area of this country of the same country uh, can I show you, for example, a picture here? Uh, I just shared the screen. Um, just a second. Uh, uh, no, he it said it's not possible to share. So, uh, I. Maybe you can try to send it. By okay. Otherwise, I can explain without. Uh, so okay, uh, now it should be possible. I ah, okay, okay. Ah, yes, now it's possible. Uh, yes. Uh, so here we can say that we have uh, uh, just a second. Yes. So what we observe is that starting from the end of February. Uh, COVID-19 has spread in Italy, no? and especially in the northern area. And what we found is compare different regions in Italy, because here it's supposed that the, the, the accounting is the same among regions. Of course, uh, it would be hard to compare Italy with Germany, with other countries, because it's possible to have different accounting. But within the same country, inside the same country, the, the accounting uh, can be uh, compare and relate uh, between uh, uh, different regions. And what we observed is that in Lombardia and Emilia Romagna, two regions, we record um, so almost uh, 20,000 of deaths uh, compared with uh, around uh, 12,000 in the rest of Italy, which includes uh, 18 regions. Uh, the same thing if we look at the lethality, so we, we do an intensive measure of the, of, of the deaths uh, from coronavirus, we can observe a huge difference between uh, Lombardia and Emilia Romagna and the rest of Italy. Uh, keep in mind that these two figures are not uh, uh, data from today, but just a few days ago, but it's, I mean, it's the same, of course. Um, what is not possible to do is look at the lethality, uh, the different lethality between regions, between countries, because as I said before, we can have a different uh, um, accounting uh, in different countries. Uh, so what we found is a huge uh, difference between these two regions with the other regions. And we know very well that these two regions are the, more, the most polluted uh, area, they represent the most polluted area in Italy for sure, and one of the most polluted area in uh, Europe. As I said before, I cannot say anything about the pollution meant as a career of the virus because it needs to be demonstrated. Uh, what, what has been demonstrated is a correlation in terms of uh, uh, pathogenic mechanism between the action of the uh, virus and the action of the pollution on the uh, immune system of uh, uh, humans. So this is something we can say uh, uh, now. Uh, concerning, I would like to, to link to the Blasi's um, presentation to say that we also uh, look at the uh, reduction, uh, in, in our case, not energetic, but it's uh, connected, of course, uh, with the energetic uh, uh, with the energy consumption. Uh, we look at the reduction of greenhouse gas emission during the lockdown in Italy, uh, and we focus on the energy sector in Italy. We focus on the energy sector for two reasons, two important reasons. First, because they cover more than 80% of total greenhouse gas emission in Italy. And second, because uh, you know, the, the, for example, livestock sector, this kind of se agricultural sector is uh, it's supposed to have not uh, stopped uh, during the lockdown because, uh, of course, they are considered essential sectors uh, uh, just for uh, eating. Uh, so, and we also, I want to say to Blasi, we also, we, we saw a shift 
in the uh, in the emissions uh, in the household for example so people had an increase of uh, emissions due to uh, people stay at home so ele electric uh, energy um, in the household uh, but at the same time uh, one huge effect was in the transport sector because in the transport sector if you stay at home you don't shift your emission or energy uh, in the case of Blasis energy uh, utilization but you just switch off and you uh, you don't move so of course the transport sector um, and uh, emission relative to this sector uh, decreased a lot in general in overall we found uh, also like Blasi said uh, we also found a decrease of around 20 22 percent of greenhouse gas emission in italy uh, so we can say here that we have january and february the pre-lockdown and then the lockdown in march and april uh, so as you can see the, the, the decrease was before 18 percent and then 23 so on average we have uh, 20 percent uh, of decrease and then it's possible also to look at single uh, category let's say electricity um, oil and uh, petroleum uh, products uh, natural gas and we also observe this shift from industry to um, house we can say and um, so this is confirmed also looking at greenhouse gas emissions uh, another thing i want to say is about uh, the um, uh, two scenario analysis also linking with the, uh, with the, what Blasi said before so we also realized two scenario, three scenario analysis of the restarting of italy uh, so after the lockdown uh, the three scenarios was based on the one it was like a business as usual scenario uh, that it means that covid-19 free so nothing uh, so we restart in the same way without any economic uh, effect which is of course something is not uh, uh, foresee but it's just to show a scenario like this uh, the second one with a decrease in GDP uh, by 4.7 percent and the scenario three is the most pessimistic and unfortunately also the the most likely uh, with a, a decrease in GDP of 9.3 percent uh, what we uh, saw from the carbon intensity of Italy is that also in the most pessimistic scenario we don't have a decrease of the carbon intensity with respect to 2018, 2017, 16, and 15, uh, but just uh, the decrease was uh, uh, with respect to 2019. Uh, why? Because uh, of course, we if we look at the carbon intensity, we have to think about that we have not increased our efficiency. We have just switch off our tap but we didn't improve the efficiency of our tap. So if we switch on the tap again, we restart again with the same, um, I mean, uh, produ production efficiency and the same greenhouse gas emissions, of course, uh, um, released in atmosphere. So this is, in my opinion, very important to be understood. So uh, we, we didn't improve our efficiency, we just switch off which is very different. Uh, so if we switch on again, uh, as you can see from the, this graphic, uh, so the carbon intensity uh, will not go down with respect to 18, 17, 16, and 15. Uh, so I think uh, this is uh, also including the, of course, the, the, the expected uh, imminent uh, economic crisis. Uh, the the voice uh, we cannot hear your voice uh, monica can you hear me now <laughs> thank you <laughs> thank you dario and uh, it was quite clear and um, yes this is uh, the uh, the discussion is uh, concerning the, our uh, our country and but i suppose it's uh, interesting also for people who are 
in other uh, contexts, in other areas, because as we, another aspect that has emerged in is how everything is connected. So I think same problems are affecting also other areas. So it's uh, interesting to learn from uh, what happened here in Italy and the analysis that have been carried out about this part of the world, uh, also in other contexts. So uh, I would like to go back to Marco. So you already told us uh, quite a lot in details about uh, the kind of analysis that has been uh, made and what is possible to do what has been possible to see uh, in this uh, laboratory that the COVID uh, created. But um, can you tell us something else, something more detailed? Yeah, uh, I, will, um, I will start from uh, some uh, consideration of, uh, on uh, the relationship between uh, the spread of the virus and, and uh, pollution. Um, I was, uh, my impression at the beginning of the lockdown was that uh, the scientific debate uh, on, this, uh, on this topic started a little bit as a romance <laughs> and then uh, day by day is getting more and more, let's say, concrete. Um, after uh, a few days, uh, uh, after, after the beginning of the lockdown, um, I read this article from some Italian researchers claiming about a possible association between PM pollution and uh, the diffusion of the COVID-19. And my first thoughts were, was, uh, how could they say so quickly? <laughs> uh, in fact, uh, there was a, a quite a, um, uh, intense debate started because uh, from this, uh, starting from this article, uh, because on uh, at the end of March, uh, for example, the Italian Aerosol Society uh, sent uh, a note in which they uh, disagree with that article, and then they were, they were then they started uh, like uh, to, the discussion started to be a little more, more concrete. Uh, there was another uh, article, uh, also uh, always from by Italian uh, scientists, that they um, was, uh, if I remember correctly, in, in April, in which they found some uh, parts of the RNA uh, that might be um, uh, basically uh, Ita some Italian scientists uh, collected some samples in, in Bergamo. Bergamo was one of the uh, most uh, hit cities uh, in Italy. And uh, they identify a, a gene that, was, that is highly specific to COVID-19 in, in multiple samples. Uh, so these are uh, just small pieces of a, of a giant puzzle. And uh, mm, my impression is that uh, uh, mm, there are um, substantially uh, so no, no, no clear, uh, clear uh, evidence that is there for uh, this uh, relationship between uh, spread, uh, the spread of the virus and uh, air pollution. Um, as you as you said in your in your, uh, in your question you, you posed, uh, there are uh, two two aspects of uh, this interaction between uh, pollution and the virus infection that must be uh, considered. Uh, the first is if the emissions and pollutant could have acted as a carrier of the of the virus, and the second is if their pollution may somehow undermine individuals' resistance to the virus and their survival uh, probability. Uh, so that if those citizens with certain pre-existing conditions, such as uh, respiratory illnesses, for example, may any, have an increase in uh, vulnerability uh, to COVID-19. Uh, <clears throat> regarding the, the, the first aspect, uh, um, that is the particular matter acting as a carrier, I think that there are three questions that must be answered. Uh, the, the first is 
if the virus remains infectious after being carried on pollutant particles. Uh, the, the second is, if the virus is infectious, has a viral load, does this virus maintain its viral load over long distance and time? Because PN 2.5 is subject to transport along over uh, long distances and, and time, and hours to, to days and kilometers. And the third question is if, if the viral concentrations carried out, uh, carried by, by particular matter, are, are high enough to, to cause infection. This is an, an open debate. It seems that uh, the answers uh, to this question could be linked to another question, that is how the coronavirus is transmitted. I want to enter into uh, major uh, detail, but we basically know today that uh, large virus-laden droplets uh, from, uh, from a cough or a, or a sneeze uh, falls to the ground within a meter or two. Uh, then there are small droplets that are uh, small, smaller than five microns or in diameter that can remain in the air for minutes to hours and travel further. Uh, some uh, these Italian uh, um, researchers um, uh, have speculated that uh, uh, small droplets that have, let's say, 0 0.1 to 1 um, micron of diameter can be absorbed by pollution particles up to uh, the say PN10. So particles that have up to 10 mi uh, microns, micrometers of uh, uh, diameter. Uh, so they, they are source and this larger particle is uh, less dense and the, and the droplet can be uh, transported in the air for longer. But this is uh, just an assumption, it is not uh, uh, confirmed uh, at all. Um, regarding the, the, the second aspect, that is if air, air pollution may have been enhancing the, the COVID-19 diffusion, uh, the prevailing hypothesis is that the, the, that uh, said by uh, Dario Caro. Uh, so that high level of pollution uh, may be one contributor to deaths of uh, COVID-19. Uh, it is known that uh, the exposure to PM and NO2 causes uh, health damage, mainly, uh, both short-term and long-term exposure, uh, including uh, disease, uh, uh, respiratory uh, disease. Uh, we have the data from the World Health Organization that say that uh, uh, around uh, uh, 80 to 90 percent of the people who live in, in cities exposed to concentration levels of pollutants that are higher than the recommended uh, values. This obviously turns out into millions of estimated premature deaths as well uh, per year, per year, as well as other illnesses. Um, so uh, uh, the prevailing hypothesis uh, reflects on um, I totally agree with the sentence that uh, Yaron Hogan uh, said about this aspect. Uh, Yaron Hogan uh, conducted a, a study over, uh, um, over 60, uh, 60 regions in Spain, Germany, and Italy, France during the, the, the lockdown period. Uh, they found that uh, the um, 78 uh, percent of the uh, deaths uh, uh, just uh, um, were, happened in the five uh, regions and these uh, regions were the most polluted. This means something but not, not everything obviously. Um, and he said uh, that poisoning our environment means poisoning our body and when it experiences chronic respiratory stress its ability to defend itself from infection is, is limited. Um, I will not uh, repeat uh, what, what, uh, what Dario Caro already said. Um, I, I just say that uh, the, there is the need of uh, uh, more uh, epidemiological studies to clarify these, uh, these aspects. 
and, um, and I don't know if we, <laughs> if you want to know more about. Uh, I think it's. Uh, um, thank you, Marco. Now, what is clear is uh, that, uh, as you said, uh, we need more. We need more studies, and we mm. have to wait. I suppose to have uh, more clear information about the relationship uh, between the, the virus and the pollution, but still what we can say is that pollution independently from the virus is <laughs> air pollution is not good and it's something that we have to contrast. So the, the other aspect, uh, but I will ask you <laughs> more in details in the last question is about the possible policies and if we can better understand which are the causes from this, from what happened uh, of this um, uh, of the pollution in, in general. So now I will go back to the energy sector because uh, um, we have been uh, saying uh, that um, the lockdown has determined an alteration of both the production and the consumption of energy. But uh, I think uh, another aspect uh, which is interesting in this sector is uh, um, in relation to the virus is to understand if somehow it, is, it has been possible to um, highlight some uh, uh, how the situation has uh, changed in terms of energy efficiency and uh, energy e uh, saving if something has happened in this uh, so on this side, and uh, also um, if we can uh, talk about uh, uh, the, how the, the impact uh, of the virus uh, in, uh, to, to, on what concerns the energy poverty, because we've been discussing about uh, energy in general, but uh, it's uh, also important to mention the, the fact that... Uh, yeah. Very, very good point. Very good point. Especially the last one was a very good point, and uh, it links directly to what the previous two speakers were saying. So indeed, I heard with very high interest about the respiratory issues and all the points you mentioned about the um, the outsource pollution and how this affects to the respiration. There are a lot of studies, while not being any doctor or anything of that sort, but we have seen that um, the cold homes. So when a house is cold, uh, it can increase the likelihood for a damp or a mold growth. And from studies with what in our field, at least, we saw that about 30 to 50 percent, it can increase the respiratory problems. So when we have a cold house with children inside, we can have much higher respiratory problems. Uh, what does it mean a cold home, though? A cold house means a house which is not uh, heated well. And by not heated well, it means that people cannot pay the energy for heating. And that's what we see in several cases. That's one big point of the energy poverty. Or... What does it also mean that the energy, that the house is very poorly insulated? So it doesn't have any energy efficiency, let's say, uh, measures inside incorporated in, uh, in the building. This, um, this point is one of the key aspects that is linking directly the energy use to, uh, to the COVID the deaths and to the COVID problems. Um, now, before we go there, and I think that's something that we will definitely, I mean, if you give us a few minutes, I'll definitely go through that. Now, I would like just to show about the, the overall picture, as, uh, as you asked me. Uh, what is happening now in terms of, uh, of the energy efficiency? Because that's a key determinant, and it's one of the solutions, whether we find it um, extraordinary or not, to discuss it so openly, that energy efficiency is one solution to tackle also partly the COVID problem. And the COVID effects, not the problem, but the COVID effects. Because you can have the house better warmed. People, even the poorer families and the energy poor families, can have an affordable temperature in their households. So somehow uh, we have less respiratory problems and indirectly we can have a less uh, a smaller COVID effect. Let's see though the overall picture, as I mentioned. So primarily, you know that um, if we start, let's see from the EU, but also in, uh, in several parts of the world, there are specific targets for uh, the energy efficiency and um, mainly referring to the households, but also to the other sector. And in the EU, there was a directive which was updated in 2018 uh, that has set a policy framework on what actions we need to undertake in order to increase, to improve our energy efficiency and also our buildings in overall and also the other sectors in the future. So there is a target of 32.5% as a headline energy efficiency target for 2030. Um, 
This target, of course, was made based on specific assumptions from the past, and this is something what member states are trying to pursue. Um, now, next to that, next to the Energy Efficiency Directive, we have the announced the Green Deal, which is uh, the last months, it's uh, the hot debate, you know, we're all knowing, and it also uh, tackles a lot the issue of, uh, of the health linked to the pollution is one of the targets, the zero pollution Europe. Uh, um, it's this just transition, not to leave anybody behind, financing the transition, clean and affordable energy, and all these uh, targets set by the Commission, where a lot of these health regulations fall also under. And also the transition, of course, to the common economy. Now, next to the Green Deal, we also have the renovation strategy, which is a very important uh, aspect, as here it refers to the building stock and about the massive renovation effort that needs to happen in the EU. And same initiatives we also have in other countries. I'm not speaking only about the EU. Um, so in the renovation, the idea is that indeed we improve the building stock. So again, indirectly, we could claim that we try to tackle the problems of poverty and the problems of uh, respiratory and uh, health impacts. And now in the EU, what we had the uh, member states uh, where have submitted the national energy and climate plans which were uh, the framework where member states have to plan in an integrated manner in a way their climate and energy objectives, the targets and policies. And these were submitted, most of them at least, to the European Commission uh, by, before, uh, before the end of the year, where all member states declared what exactly measures they are going to undertake for their energy transition. And in the energy transition, as I said, we refer also to the buildings and to all the relevant sectors, also production, sec power production sectors. So if we translate everything into health effects, we can have some nice numbers about what each member state tries to do. Now, um, I will go a bit to a more gloomy picture now, though, because, as I said, this uh, national energy, cl energy and climate plans, some, in some countries, they were quite ambitious about the energy transition and about cleaning the economy, moving away from uh, dirty coals and uh, oils and, um, and fossil fuels and move to a very green, uh, shiny and happy picture. Though, what we see now is that, um, in order to be realistic, of course, is that all these any national energy climate plans, they were based on assumptions uh, before the COVID of the economy. And what do I mean with that? Most of them were based on a constant demand growth, energy demand growth, which would happen up to 2030. Okay. And um, they were also assuming an average GDP growth. I, I wouldn't bet it, but it's about 2%. You can 2 to 3% or 1 to 2%, let's say, for all member states in an average thing. Um, but of course, now we have a 5 to 10% contraction levels in, uh, in the economy, based on the several countries we see the figures. Uh, and also we have a loss of, uh, of uh, energy demand. Though I would say that um, as a first part, that the, the pictures we have from what member states at least in the EU, want to do is not maybe that clear and things should be revisited. That's at least the understanding we have from all the work we are doing also for the European Commission and the various projects. Um, the numbers we have and the, and the um, scenarios we have for 2030, I don't believe they will be the same as they were six months ago. Okay, that's the first point that we have to keep in mind. So, every, and what does it mean that everything about the energy transition and about all the new and cleaner um, technology that we want to implement, we have to take into account the current status of the demand, the, the dropping of the demand, and what expectations we have for a GDP growth, because GDP has fallen. Now, also, if we take into account the targets that the EU had about the renewable energy, the energy efficiency, and the greenhouse gas emissions, we see that except for the renewable energy, um, where things are moving well on track, we have in some countries, they have also exceeded the targets, energy efficiency was way lagging behind. So, uh, it, so the energy efficiency is a difficult one because it needs effort, it needs a lot of money, and sometimes, of course, it, it doesn't, it has, it, you can do it with zero cost, but if you want really to go for a refurbishment and for changing the buildings, there is a big capital uh, required, <clears throat> and, you, and you don't really see the difference quite easily because you just have a building in the end of the day, uh, and it's difficult also to measure. Of course, there are everything, protocols and ways to do it. But um, it's something that for a citizen, um, it's the only thing they can see the difference is within their households, if it's healthier, if it's better air, and if they don't spend so much on electricity bill in the, or heating uh, or gas for their heating. So, as I said, for the energy efficiency trends, before the COVID, things were not going so well. Um, then another thing that we have to see is that the, when the targets, uh, if we take a business as usual scenario, at least for the EU, 
for the investments that were required for all the refurbishments in the buildings. I'm just sticking to the buildings because it's more linked to the, uh, to the COVID discussion. So if we take into account, for example, the buildings and the investments required in the residential sector, for a business as usual scenario, meaning without the new targets that were set, there would be around 125 uh, billion euros uh, annual, average annual investments from 2021 to 2030. Now that we have the increase of the targets, so 32.5%, as I said, energy efficiency, the total amount could be around 250 billion euros, so almost doubling uh, annual investments. Now, keep in mind that uh, the funds and the recovery funds and all these packages that will hopefully be approved uh, by the EU in the coming days, in the coming period, for all the member states that have suffered the greatest losses, so all these COVID funds, if we can just put them in the basket. So if we take into account all these COVID funds, um, I'm, I'm pretty sure, I think that's quite obvious that all these amounts that are being dedicated, these 250 billion euros uh, investments required, uh, they will not happen to a great extent because these funds unavoidably will be moved to other areas in the economy with higher needs like tourism and all the other sectors that have suffered much more. And uh, it's pretty, it could be diffi difficult because the investments from the member states in this aspect could definitely could fall. Okay. So here is an open risk coming up from the COVID that although we will have more money in the economy, maybe the money will be diverted to health issues, direct health, which is logical also in a way. Eh? But this can be a risk for the attaining of the energy efficiency targets and also for the, for, the, for the overall health issues of the energy efficiency. Another thing is the energy prices, especially the oil prices. Uh, you know, the energy prices and the oil price is a key determinant for uh, promoting energy efficiency, especially in heating, I would say, because still big part of the EU uses oil or fossil fuels for heating. Now, uh, the, low, the low oil price that happened uh, due to the COVID period has also been quite competitive to the energy efficiency and especially to the heating sector. What do I have? Uh, I think from Italy, Spain, and at least from Greece and maybe the Balkan area also, I'm pretty sure that due to the low oil prices, all the households that had an oil heater, they filled in their tanks. At least we saw it in many countries, whether we like to hide it or not, but it happened everywhere, I'm pretty sure. Um, so it means we had an increase of the oil consumption, and this oil will burn also, eventually in the air, to heat up the homes in the next year. Um, so we can see that the price effect of the oil uh, had a negative aspect in what will happen with the respiratory issues for the next period, as this will eventually burn. And also, um, this... Um, the effect of the, of the lower oil price, of course, it's coming it's starting to pick up now, but the effect of this has not helped the decarbonization of heating. Heating, in uh, at least a big part of the EU, is still a very heavily carbon-intensive uh, game, in a way. Okay, now, for uh, another, uh, maybe some last things, and I will finish my story, is that uh, we have also, under the, under the EU, there is also um, one of the regulations, which is mainly from the US, and it's uh, being transposed now to the EU, which is called Energy Efficiency First Principle. What does it say, the Energy Efficiency First Principle? It's a fundamental principle for policy making, uh, planning and investment in the energy sector, uh, where all the EU systems should be uh, designed. And what does it mean, actually, that we have to consider, keep in mind, the potential value of investing in energy efficiency, so including the energy savings and all this stuff, in all decisions about the energy system development if that is homes, offices, industry, or mobility. So where the efficiency improvements are shown to be more cost-effective, so meaning if it's more cost-effective, let's say it in a simple way, if it's more cost-effective to improve the building stock in a region, so in the original plants, because it can generate more benefits, not only economic energy saving, but also health benefits, respiratory and all this stuff, then taking into account all these co-benefits, these investments should be prioritized over any investment in power generation, grids, pipelines, and fuel supplies. To give it a, to make a long story short, we have regions which are trying to decarbonize. And what do they do? Okay, we'll bring natural gas. Simple question on that. Natural gas is still not a clean fuel. Okay, it still creates um, gases. Based on the energy efficiency first principle, which is a mandatory now, the commission is trying to make it in a mandatory part. What would that mean? That we don't go directly into new gas pipelines to heat up our homes or to use for gas or for electricity production, but rather we should always check whether energy efficiency in buildings or in other sectors would be more cost effective. And cost effective, I said, and in terms of savings, so lower bills, but also in terms of health benefits. Okay, 
and other, of course, and employment benefits, which is also in the end. Now, um, unfortunately, most of the member states have not taken energy efficiency first principles so seriously so far. And what does it mean? That we see that a lot of massive infrastructural projects being designed for, dirty f for uh, fossil fuels or for not clean energy going on, which would definitely have more health impacts in the future. And they put it under some labels of uh, intermediate or transition fuel, which I don't understand how if you put pipelines in a whole country, you can make a transition. It would end up for many years still. Okay. Then uh, about the energy poverty, and here I'm finishing the story, is that um, energy poverty, it was nice mentioned, but just to make it clear to what we define is that uh, it's a situation where uh, individuals uh, or households cannot adequately heat or cool, let's say, or provide other required services in their homes at an affordable cost. I think this definition makes it uh, quite clear. The drivers, of course, is the efficiency of the buildings, that it's not very low. Uh, they cannot have access to clean and affordable energy carriers. Several, we have a lot of households still in the EU, uh, Central and Eastern Europe and other areas, also the South. Um, climate, exacerbated by extreme weather events, but of course, income. The income is not high. Now, up to 82.3 million year, um, sorry, uh, uh, yeah, we have, let's say, a million people are energy poor in the EU based on these indications. Um, and how do we measure them? That they cannot pay the utility bills, that they are unable to keep the house warm, or they have a high expenditure in, um, in this household. So if we assume that we have 82.3 million, keep in mind that um, what happens is that uh, uh, when we had the COVID outbreak, um, let's say uh, the energy poverty increased. Why? Because the energy needs grew. As we saw, the residential energy demand grew, but also from, being, from the point that we're all being closed up, a big part of the population lost their income or reduced their income. So if we take the ratio income to energy expenditure, we get a much higher ratio, a much higher problem here, leading to higher energy poverty. Um, this has enlarged so the problem, and um, it's, uh, there are there's specific policies need to be addressed. There are already a lot of discussions in place, but I'm pretty sure that uh, still we need quite a more coherent policy and coherent strategy to address that on the energy poverty, as I said, and this is directly linked to the COVID situation. So. Um, I think that's more or less based on my time. Thank you. Thank you, Vlasis. Um, so now I think you, are, you, you have been talking about uh, policies uh, and uh, energy, uh, energy policies. And so I, use, I just link this uh, uh, to the last question that I want to make because uh, um, we are acting now and uh, all the states, the member states, but also in other parts of the world, uh, the decision that uh, our, the governments are taking in relation to the environment uh, are, uh, and not only, but to the economy are in this situation of the emergency are linked to the fear of uh, um, the reception, um, recession that is going to happen, we are almost sure. And uh, as you said, all the policies that uh, previous of the COVID has been implemented uh, are based on, uh, on a different world. Now we have to reconsider all the strategies and the goals and the, the, the economical strategies. But I think it's important to continue to, to remember that previous to the COVID, uh, one of the main treats that uh, we were trying to, um, to, to fight against was the climate change and the global warming. So uh, I think the risk, as I mentioned before, is that uh, fall, trying to follow and to, the, and to go on the economical aspect aspect of the recession and to go back to a uh, uh, previous rate of growth, uh, the, the um, environmental policies will suffer again and will be uh, pose uh, at the second level of importance, which is not, uh, uh, of course, uh, a good thing. So I, will, I just want to ask you, in your opinion, from your different perspective, um, if you can, if you try to imagine a situation, post-pandemic situation, uh, which uh, uh, are the the aspects uh, and the policies that you think uh, are uh, more important uh, uh, to be considered and to 
not only to cope with this, the risk of uh, this kind of, event, of events that we have been experiencing in recent months, but uh, more in general in, uh, in relation to the previous situation, uh, which was already quite problematic in terms of climate change and global warming. So this question is for was the three of, of you. <laughs> yes, uh, can start. I mean, like uh, I try to be uh, as concrete as possible uh, because this question require concreteness. So and and uh, short as much as possible. So um, in my opinion, I I, I can uh, I would say three main things to do now. Uh, this is because I think these three things are the, the probably the easiest or the less hard to do, and also because it's uh, they are very important in my opinion to uh, I mean to contrast uh, especially climate change, which is the now the most urgent issue uh, of our century. So I think the first one is a, a more sustainable mobility. Uh, especially in the cities, so inside the cities, and this is possible uh, uh, to do with, uh, uh, um, of course, uh, intensivizing the, the bike and the uh, bike utilization and the public transport. Uh, instead, for long distance, uh, the electric mobility combined with the electric production from renewable from renewable energy. So uh, this is probably the main point, especially for big cities. This is very urgent right now, especially also for uh, Italian city where uh, this aspect is harder than, for example, uh, cities in the Nordic country like Copenhagen where I live. Uh, that they should be an example, city uh, such as Copenhagen and Amsterdam, they should work as an example in this case for other European city. Of course, by considering the limits that other city has uh, with respect to, uh, to a city such as Copenhagen or Amsterdam. Uh, the second point, in my opinion, is a carbon tax because this is um, the only way to take into account uh, social and uh, environmental aspects in the prices of the uh, of our products and this is relevant uh, because can create uh, fair competitiveness uh, uh, between uh, uh, production systems and drive more uh, sustainable choices because usually we, we tend to say we should buy this product because it's more sustainable, but the price is higher than another one. So in this way, you cannot drive more sustainable choice. So in this case, the only way to do is to apply uh, a carbon tax and consider uh, social and environmental aspect in the final price of a product. Um, I can give an example. For example, you can say, try to eat Italian meat, but then you go to the grocery and you find meat uh, from, uh, I don't know, New Zealand, that is also good maybe, and the price is uh, half price than Italian meat. And that's of course because the, the social and the environmental aspects connected with that meat are not considered in the final price. And this is something we cannot uh, uh, continue to do if we want to uh, drive more sustainable uh, choices. Uh, finally, uh, I think now one of the most urgent problems is the, depending on the country, but it's the waste management. So, uh, manage of waste depending on the country needs to be uh, prioritized uh, for so many countries. And here we have different level of uh, development, of course. We cannot ask the same uh, develop to a developing country or a developed country. So, but also in the developed country, there is a huge difference because here, for example, in Denmark, we uh, the, they they establish to push uh, effort in the incineration of the waste, and they try to find the best uh, and uh, most efficient way uh, to recover energy from waste. 
that's a choice. Uh, it's not uh, uh, for sure the only choice that you have because also the investment in uh, uh, circularity opportunities of the waste, and I'm, I'm talking about circular economy, is another maybe also better choice. Uh, but for sure, we need uh, to uh, to take uh, one way and uh, and make efforts in that way, uh, um, regardless uh, what, what kind of choice we we take about the waste management. But in so many places, the waste management is not considered, uh, and we don't make the necessary effort uh, that this moment require. Uh, so this is my three points. Then, of course, I could continue because they are not the only, but I mean, like, in my opinion, now they are the most urgent. Okay. Thank you, Dario. Uh, yes, maybe we can organize another webinar and continue to discuss uh, this topic, but now we're running out of time, so I will switch, I will pass, uh, give the floor to Marco and then to Blasis. Uh, and uh, yes, can you tell us, answer this question? Um, maybe I will be a little bit less concrete than, than Dario. Uh, I, I, I think that uh, this, uh, uh, this, this period uh, left uh, us a very important uh, message. Uh, the message is that if, uh, a problem, if, if a problem is treated with the due consideration, uh, administration and citizens are able to work together and fa face the problem and possibly overcome that problem. Um, coronavirus is, or I uh, would like to say, uh, has been uh, an emergency that had no precedent in, uh, in history. And uh, in this period, the administration had to took uh, uh, some measure that uh, they had never been taken into consideration uh, before. And, and people and citizens with uh, a lot of efforts uh, showed uh, a capacity to adapt to this measure that, that was unthinkable. Um, so, uh, under some point of view, and, and, and thinking particularly to the climate issues, but also air, to the air quality issues, uh, the environmental concerns represent today uh, an emergency that is similar to some extent to the COVID-19 event. So, in my opinion, uh, worldwide administration should treat environmental issues with primary consideration, just like uh, a sort of emergency. Uh, I, I take the, the, the example of, uh, of Italy. In Italy, uh, the World Health Organization estimated that every year about 90,000 people uh, dies for, because of air pollution. That it means that in three years, uh, or five or four years, uh, we have the same amount of deaths uh, that uh, uh, COVID event caused. So, uh, what what this event showed us? Uh, it showed that if this uh, problem is treated with uh, primary consideration, so it's, uh, uh, it's uh, effective and quick actions are taken. It is possible to do that. Uh, in in general, I think that most of the I'm, I'm, I'm talking about uh, Europe. Um, I think that most of the correct environmental policies are already uh, in place. Uh, it's just a quick and effective action uh, is, uh, is missing. Uh, we, we know the problems, we know the, uh, we scientifically know the, the problems uh, of air pollution and the, the lethal effects that this problem may cause to uh, ecosystems or, or population. We also know in, in good part uh, the potential effects that uh, could arise in the future if this problem will still be treated without the adequate consideration. Uh, so, well, in my opinion, uh, the environmental policies are there, but uh, some uh, action and, uh, is, uh, is missing and some uh, efforts to, to to face the problem like an emergency is, is missing. Now, uh, 
being a little bit more concrete um, and entering into the, the details of uh, your questions, uh, I think that uh, I thought about uh, two considerations. Uh, the first is, is uh, the, the, re the reduction of pollution in, in general, um, where all the policies uh, point to. Uh, so so uh, this period, uh, as I said before, showed us that uh, traffic, po traffic pollution is, uh, is uh, important, is uh, emission from traffic are an important contribution, but uh, not only. Um, now, in Europe, we, uh, all local administration have uh, um, uh, uh, mobility plans, air quality plans that uh, set a uh, very detailed uh, number of uh, actions that could be, uh, should be implemented to, uh, to improve mobility. Um, some, in some countries, as uh, uh, Copenhagen or other countries, uh, these uh, plans uh, are uh, efficient and uh, are in, in place and are uh, completed. Uh, in some other cities are uh, still faces, uh, I think about uh, Italy, for example, uh, they are still facing significant challenges uh, that require, first of all, uh, money to be implemented, um, expertise, and also they require a, a cultural uh, shift, uh, cultural change by, by the population. Um, the, so this, these policies, uh, uh, as I said, uh, this, this policy must, uh, should uh, point a little bit more to, to mobility, uh, I think. And um, in particular, uh, other than the uh, aspects that Dario Caro already said, um, I think that in, in Italy and in cities, uh, there is the need of uh, improved uh, intermodality to, uh, because I think that the, the possibility to shift uh, from one media of transport to another, uh, it is an uh, important aspect for sustainability, uh, sustainable uh, mobility. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, one is uh, for the, uh, one aspect is for the policies to focus on, on mobility. Uh, another aspect is uh, regarding, uh, as you said, the effects of this uh, pandemic that could have uh, on environmental policies. Um, I, I think it's still early to say that, um, and say if and how there will be some, uh, some effects. Um, maybe, uh, it, uh, uh, say maybe that the concentration limits will be, will be changed. And maybe now we know that European limits are uh, much higher than those recommendations that those recommended by the WHO. Um, maybe this will not happen because we still have problems to respect these uh, limits in Europe. So why set another more strict uh, uh, limits? Uh, so uh, I, 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 I still don't know, it's early to say what would be the effect in terms of uh, um, precise, uh, um, precise decision and precise environmental uh, elements. Okay, so thank yeah. you a lot. Uh, and, uh, okay, I'll, I'll go then back so you we don't... Uh... Uh, yeah, we try to finish some time. So I'll go back to the discussions we had and then coming back to the policy and what will happen with the environmental policies should aim at. Uh, mainly again from the point of energy, okay, let's, we spoke about the clean and what means clean energy and the energy efficiency and what these things should happen, that's fine. Now, let's see about the poverty because as we said, the link is quite more direct to the, to the COVID situation and what should happen. Now, I mean, the emergency, the emergency measures we have so far on the energy poverty were, uh, what we saw at least was to ban the disconnections between electricity, so for people could keep their house warm and have electricity. Uh, there were guarantees for delayed payments to the electricity utilities, uh, subsidies or discounts to, from the electricity utility, from the energy utility to the consumers, and also tariff adjustments in some cases. Now, it's one thing is for sure that if we have affordable energy bills, okay, and warm homes or cool homes, let's say in the southern part of Europe or in the warmer part of Europe, this should play 
a vital role in maintaining the all in maintaining our the people's health. Okay, that's the first and basic uh, conclusion. What we have to say, based on that, in the short term, government must have and the energy companies, of course, all the utilities should have immediate help with energy bills for those uh, low incomes. There are specific modules on how to do it uh, and how I mean uh, um, electricity energy utilities are um, addressing the energy poverty problem for their consumers. So there is good, a lot of good practices in the field. Then um, also um, in, the long in the longer run, a government should uh, carry out major home renovation programs. And that's already, at least it is a plan for most member states to do so. And it's also this renovate Europe thing going up now and um, the renovation wave as it's being called and that's i think the entire picture behind it by having ho massive renovation home programs we can ensure warm healthy homes and affordable energy bills for all so this means that less uh, respiratory diseases less uh, um, eventually covid uh, yeah deaths and all that and then on um, also for the con for the countries that do have a lot of coal and they are mainly working on the coal and they try to delignitize themselves or lignite and they try to delignitize themselves like there are a lot of regions in the EU. Uh, there is a, you know, we are all aware that there is this just transition funds and the recovery packages that are being generated by the European Commission, by the European Union. Now there, there has to be a clear mandate towards energy efficiency, renewable energy. So there must not be any, as I repeat what I said before. So we must avoid all these obsolete plans for fossil fuels on um, on both in, for both environmental but also employment reasons uh, for environmental first of all is because by bringing in fossil fuels again to the picture with massive investments in essence we don't clean up anything okay the problem still remains if we speak about health issues then we must also take into account the um the, the energy efficiency aspects for the reasons we explained above and also about the employment because that's something a, a good reasoning always if you see the recent mckinsey report that was out uh, it demonstrated that for every, let's say, $10 million spent, uh, we can create 75 jobs on renewable energy, 77 jobs in energy efficiency, and 27 jobs in fossil fuels. So you can see that if we add up energy efficiency, renewable energy, we're about 150, 155 jobs full time, while for fossil fuels, it's 27 jobs. Given that, I, will, uh, I think if we speak about the recovery period after the COVID, and the economic recovery after the COVID, I think this leaves the last point, and we have to make our options and our choices as societies where we want to end up. Okay, thank you very much for that. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, I just have to conclude, uh, the, and uh, we, are, we are 10 minutes in late, so I would like to thank you all. It has been a very rich discussion. Um, data as we saw are still under observation. We have been able to describe some trends, uh, but uh, also we have been able, there are something that we can say that, that, that there is a very strong correlation between economy, health and environment. And uh, that, uh, as uh, you already mentioned, uh, the, we have been able to see how the government at different level have been uh, have been able to take uh, decision. Health uh, and be, has been placed uh, uh, at first, uh, and uh, we can hope that the environmental issues and the environmental policies will gain a new space uh, also in the post-COVID uh, uh, world. So thanks uh, again to Dario Caro, to Marco Ravina, and to Vlasis Oikonomou for joining us to this round, round table and uh, the audience for the attention. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you.